My, t- my talk is going to be how to set up and run a wet lab. Uh, at the start of the session, if we can have polls on just to get an overview, how many of you assess your residents using a wet lab? Number one I, was... Yes, just not, t- just a moment. Yeah. I'll, I'll look for the question. Yeah. yeah. So setting up, some people are using wet labs and some people are using simulators. So just have an idea of uh, how you got all of you work. That will give us an idea how we proceed forward. So the first option is not at all, then once every month, then once every three months, then once every six months, or once every year. Okay. I'm just going to show the results. Right, okay. Do the, do the results so appear on your screen, Mine? Right, yeah. So uh, yeah. if everybody can see them, it's 50% of the, of the teachers don't use uh, the wet lab, residence wet lab, while 30% use once a year. So that's a important thing when we start off. So probably I'll focus more on what are the advantages of the wet lab, and it's probably being more going to be more interesting for you to know how you can set up a wet lab and how important it is for you uh, to do this for your residents so they can uh, do safe surgery because that is what we want that every person who is handling the patients he can do it as good as or as safely as a senior consultant can do so you can get good outcome because nowadays with who they're not talking about the number of cataract surgeries they're saying how many cataract surgeries are done and what are the outcomes of cataract surgery? Is the patient uh, sort of visually enabled after cataract surgery? So what are the steps? So if you take up the steps, number one is setting up the physical space as such. Second is establishing appropriate faculty and curriculum, which is very important. Then is obtaining the practice eye, stabilizing the eye, preparing the eye, and funding the wet lab and probably one more is how do you assess your residents on a wet lab because that becomes important as well when you're doing uh, this setting up the wet lab so worse is setting up the physical space the wet lab room probably that is not very difficult in your department you will always have space where you can set up stuff so you need to get hold of that room you need to get hold of instruments you need to get hold of a coordinator and then cleaning of instruments, whichever are going to run over there. This just gives you an overview of how a wet lab can be. And this is a very good paper by Mishra on setting up a wet lab. And here you can see how they've set it up. I think setting it up a wet lab, it is very important. You have the exact school stools. You have the space for the legs to go in. If you agree that it's going to be of no use. Then having a video monitor is very important for the, the person who's monitoring is or the, the, the supervisor. He can see how the person is doing and he can give him supervision of how you can do. Here you can see the microscope is only a single head, but a multi-head microscope gives you a steropsis and the, and the assisting surgeon or the supervisor can show the residents what is the correct way of doing it. I have learned use the wet lab when I was doing training and I found it really, really interesting and really useful to getting my hand steady. That's one very important because sometimes whenever you start, some people say, oh, you've got so much travels. You can never be a surgeon. But obviously, it's practice that makes you perfect. So you need a complete set of cataracts, you need sutures, 10 nylon, which is your bread and butter. You need gloves, blades, dustbin with colored coated garbage bags, a refrigerator, a microwave, or an oven toaster, and storage covered. So you, you'll see later on, why do we need a microwave using a wet lab? It's it's uh, it's something which I could question initially. And an air conditioner, obviously, to run in, and in a quiet setting. is the same. The reason 
when you're breaking up a bit, I'm not sure you can do anything about that. Mm-hmm. Moin, we can't can't hear you, Moin. Sorry about this. I mean, Moin, we can't hear you. Uh, your internet connection may not be that great. At least I can't. I assume everyone else is having the same issue. Yes, I'm having the same issue. Uh, all right. Yeah, Moin, you're still, if you can hear us. Oh. Okay, so we lost him for a second. Um, when we'll see if he comes back. If worse comes to worse, we'll we can move his talk to next week, perhaps if he's available. We'll see. Now here he's back. You're on mute, I think, Moin. You're on mute. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, there was a disconnection on that. I'll just share my screen again if it's okay. uh, gone yeah. off. We lost you. I think sort of on the. Let's see which slide it was. Uh, go go back a slide. Right, this one. Uh, no. One. Go back one more backward. No, no. Okay, no, no, oh, no. Keep going forward. Probably I went this one. Wet lab. I did the wet lab yeah. complete. You, yeah, this. Yeah, you did this slide. So I think the next yeah. slide. Okay. Yeah. So these are the instruments which I was showing initially at that level. Okay. So these are the instruments which I was talking about, that these are essential because the, 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 the residents also need to know what type of instruments they're going to use and they need to name, know the name of the instruments in this, which is as important as well. So whenever you start, uh, I've had wet labs running in my department. I thought, thought the major problem running a wet lab is not having an established curriculum. What are you going to treat? teach them because I've, what I've done is I've asked them to just go and do wet lab and just sit there and I'll come and supervise or send senior residents as well. But I thought it's not giving them that incentive and it's not giving them that much of uh, motivation to do that. So, but if you have a curriculum here, I was going through the internet and we found one very good paper in which we got this wet lab curriculum in which you can see the first year, you know all your instruments on the cataract tray and then the second is demonstrate placement of single suture using 10-0 ten, ten nylon. In the wet lab, you can use a porcine or a cadaver eyes and you place a suture at the end of the case when you're doing a real OR. So these are the steps. You let the resident do this in the wet lab. You think he's safe. You take him to the OR and do that on the real person as well. Then demonstrate the ability to flay, fold and place an IUL and folding and place an in a porcine eye, and then you can place at the end of the senior resident or the attending case. You can see these uh, steps have been designed according to the difficulty of the procedure. So of the step of cataract surgery, that is very important to identify that placement of 10 nylon is probably easier than doing a CCC, so you don't give it in the same step as you would do a cataract surgery. Then you can know the knowing the types of OVDs, use both cohesive and dispersive OVDs in the wet lab. And then you can put uh, OVD before IUL for before senior residents. Then you can use the demonstrate to remove OVD with INA. You can use an IA, IA in the wet lab to remove OVD and remove OVD in the attending or the resident case. That is a safer procedure for a first year resident rather than a second year resident. So you can, in the second year, you go on to the ability to perform capsular access, and then you go on to the ability to place a groove in the nucleus and use the ability to use two instruments. Now you're trying to get ambidextrous, which is most important, and then demonstrate the ability to create a clear corneal wound. So these are the steps which you could go and do in the wet lab and then use the coordinated OR experience, which is aligned with your wet lab curriculum. So the resident knows that when he knows this, then he can go on to that step. He feels happy, he feels motivated, 
and he's doing steps safely. That makes him more uh, motivated to do better, better surgery next time. And the third year understanding the FACO parameters, you experiment with the bottle height, wound leak, vacuum, and flow rate. And then you can use that to adjust during surgery yourself. And then you can use advanced procedures like demonstration or CTR. So usually the curriculum is mostly for the third year, up to the third year resident and the fourth year probably you think is more proficient in doing the whole of the surgery. In the end, I'll discuss something about rubrics, which are very important to assess these residents and to grade them and to give them feedback how they're doing. Then the next step is obtaining the eye. You can use a rejected, unfit donor cornea. You can use a goat's eye. You can use porcine eyes, or you can use a wax artificial eyes made from synthetic raisins. Sometimes, some places you will have restriction because of transmissible diseases and probably goat's eyes and porcine eyes sometimes might not be uh, feasible or allowed. So you can use the wax or artificial eyes. Then you can need to know about the eye stabilizing devices. I think the easiest one, you've seen the dummies in shops, which are styrofoam heads, which you can use pins to use to use fixation. It is easy to use, it's cheap, but the problem is the eye is unstable and mannequin head can talk with a little manipulation. This is a typical styrofoam head. The other is an O2 device, which is a small funnel bulb holder with a vacuum suction embedded in a styrofoam. So this is an advanced form of a styrofoam head. And you can see over here, this is a suction device and which is attached to a syringe. And with this, you get more stability when you have suction. The use of the suction is to increase the intraocular pressure as well. Then the next device which you can use is Mendel's head mount. It's a very uh, useful device. I think when you go to the American Academy, you can uh, Academy meetings, you can get them in the exhibition halls and they're on sale. There's a plastic bulb holder on plexiglass with a vacuum syringe mount and device. I've used this and I think it's, it's a wonderful device. It's very easy, very practical. The, the disadvantage is it does not have the ability to simulate the correct hand positioning because you do not have the head on which to place your hands. Then you go on to the next one is a Porello device, which is an elaborate device with multiple parts, including a plexiglass bulb, holder, red reflexor, reflector plate, and a PVC base. So this is more advanced form of the styrofoam head, and you can use that for using intraocular, checking intraocular pressure as well. It's a complicated setup, but it allows training of all anterior segment and ocular surgical procedures. Red reflector plate stimulates intraocular optics. So that is very important that you get that red reflex which you want when you want to learn surgery. Then you've got spring action apparatus for fixation of the eyeball. The next step is whenever you have the eye, the eye is moving, probably you cannot do a stable surgery or practice a stable surgery at that time. So this is how you can use that from the side. And the other thing is a film roll box mount, which is very useful and very easy to use. The cylindrical box, which used to go side, that is mounted on a rectangular thermocall so that it presents the surgical field. Then in India, they've got this eye stand plus, eye stand with a fixation head, eye mask, fake or practice head, fixation head. They're made of plastic, an eye stand ball stand. And you've got the FACO practice size as well, which is probably available in different parts of the world in the US and the UK as well. But these are devices which can be used for wetland. If you know the resources, then it's very useful how you can use them. And you just a brief, uh, quick going through how you prepare the eye, fixating the capsule, and then inducing the cataract. The interior capsule of the pig, pig is significantly thicker and elastic. And porcine anterior capsulotomy is a better model of pediatric capsulotomy. A mixture of formaldehyde and 0.7% of OVD or hydroxymethyl cellulose and aging the mixture overnight and room temperature. And this is placed on the porcine anterior capsule and the capsule will stiffen to closely resemble a human senile capsule. So this is something which I learned later on. But when I did my CCCs on on Animal eye, I used to use the other way, but this is a very important thing which we need to know earlier. Microwave energy, as I said, why do you need this? Microwave, 
You can use porcine ice for 9 sec to induce a cataract, which is quick but not dense. Then chemical induction with fixation of 433 of formaldehyde, formalin, ethanol, and propylene. And you can get cataracts of different grades. And then human cataract implantation in a capsular bag, which you can practice very easily. Funding is donation from ophthalmic surgical companies, expired products in operating rooms, and grant to conduct studies. So regarding, I uh, just uh, run the, because 50% were not using this. So I don't know, let's see the 30% who are using this once a year. Are they using any, so I, if Eduardo, if you can run the poll for this, we can have this. Yes, if you can just use. a minute. Thank you. So regarding assessing wet leg performance by trainees, I use, do you use a rubric to assess surgical skills? I know about rubrics. The second answer question is for, for checking the skills, but do not use them. And the last is, I'm not sure what a rubric is. So those are the three questions. If we have an answer to them, then. Okay, answers are coming in. Do you see the box? Mine? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Uh, shall I okay. minimize well, this? Uh, no, it doesn't matter. I'll, I'll, for some we, presenters, it didn't show. Um, we see the box. We just don't see the, any answers. Yes. Answers are coming in. I will end the poll now. I share the results. Okay. And uh, the results are appearing on my yeah. so control computer. So I mean, most of them do not know what a rubric is. So it's is the right place to know about rubrics because Carl Goldlink, he's the father of creating rubrics along with the team, Eduardo and Gabby, for creating rubrics for the used to work with ICO initially in our Pelmic Foundation. And it's a very essential you, tool you can use to, to assess what a resident can do and then take through them a different through different steps. I think it's a totally different topic on discussing what rubrics are. I'll just give you an overview and you can find them online on the internet at PubMed, the ICO ophthalmology, surgical competency assessment rubric for phaco emulsification. I think Carl has mentioned that they use this in China for training on wet labs. So you can see they are graded according to a novice, beginner, advanced beginner, and a competent. So this is the grading of surgeons. And then you can, the resident is doing the surgery and the trainer is assessing him on this chart. And he knows that if he does this, then he'll be a novice. And if he does this, he's a competent surgeon. And what you want is at the end of surgery, the person is a competent surgeon. So you can see the first is you start off with draping, incision, then, then you go on to appropriate use of safe insertion, capsular access. So there are different steps which you can use and you can share this with the resident. The resident knows that he's going to be assessed on this. So he works hard on those and then he's assessed accordingly. So why in the, I think this poll is just brief outline or just an open-ended question. Why do we prefer wet lab training for your residents? Even if you're not doing wet labs, probably you can answer what, why will you do wet lab training? Or do you think it's important for the residents to undergo wet lab training? Or do you think just going straight ahead, doing cataract surgery on the patients is as good as a wet lab? We can get- Moin, the, I, I will just say, Moin, that next next week, we'll have a plenty on rubrics. So we'll be talking about sure, that's good. rubrics. We'll be talking about other ways to assess clinical skills and so on. So they'll definitely uh, they'll definitely get more on rubrics in the next session uh, next week. Oh, that's great. Because that's, I just wanted to highlight that this can use be in the in the wet lab as well as a tool. But yes, uh, I was just, as yeah. Carl mentioned, we're going to hear about this. Okay, let me share. Let me see the answers. One answer is uh, because it's more easy to get to get all, and the other one says less cost. So yes, that's those are the main questions 
uh, or the main uses of using a wet lab compared to doing on the main resin. So this is very important thing. I think I would encourage each of you to have this incorporated in your training program. It's very easy to incorporate. And once it's up and running, you will have you will see that the, the, the training improves from the residents. You'll get good feedback from the residents and uh, you will see your patients are going having good outcomes as well. Then so, the last one was probably, why do you prefer a wet lab? So we've already, so do you have, the other question was, if some people don't have a wet lab and they have got more funding, do they have a virtual simulator for your residents? Virtual simulators are probably expensive. IC is one then help me see the organization. They've got good simulators. Now they have wonderful simulators, 3D simulators with head mounts in which you can do real-time surgery, cataract surgery, and they can give you a good uh, complicated case because it's inbuilt. And the other important thing is you've got those steps which are lined that whatever you did wrong and how you did this, those are outlined in this. Uh, so nobody probably know. is using a virtual yes. simulator. Yeah. Uh, yes. No, no. Let me see. No. 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 Yeah. Yes. Yes. Not anymore. <laughs> not anymore. Three no. Right. Two yes and one not anymore. So if you are not using a virtual simulator, if you go to any international meeting, I would encourage you to go and just check out a virtual simulator and see how where the world is going and how. You can improve yourself, how you can train. It's like just going, doing, um, uh, running a, a game in which you can change the difficulty of what you can do. You can go to a very hard cataract. You can go zonular dehiscence and you can do that procedures and then get tracking of how well you did and what step you made wrong. So in conclusion, obtaining proficiency in surgery cannot be done by reading textbooks. And hands-on trading in the real operator or in a similar environment is required. Virtual simulators may play a role in training of future surgeons, but wet lab is an important part of cataract surgical training at this time because it's cheap, it's easy, and it is something which is very easy and it's more acceptable to the residents as well. So I'd like to thank you, the Ophthalmic Foundation, for giving me this opportunity. Will, if there's any questions, obviously you can send them online and we are happy to answer them. Thank you.